In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream to show him what will happen in the future. None of his wise men or seers could tell him what he dreamed, or interpret the dream. Their wisdom was exposed as a fake, so the king commanded all of them to be executed. Among the king's wise men and servants was a Hebrew man called Daniel. Daniel turned to God in prayer and God showed him both the king's dream and its interpretation. So Daniel explained it to the king. Daniel told the king that none of the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers would be able to interpret his dream, but that there was a God in heaven who revealed secrets and that God had revealed to Nebuchadnezzar what would happen in the last days. The head of gold was a symbol of the Babylonian Empire. After that, there will rise another empire, less powerful, and then another empire, and another, and eventually the empire will be divided. The stone that hit the statue was a symbol of God's kingdom. In the days of these kings, God will raise up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and the kingdom will not be given over to any other nation thereafter. This prophecy is from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the kingdom of God will be established at the end of history. But God showed Daniel more. In the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, we're told that Daniel received a vision. This vision was about four beasts that come up from out of the sea. According to the messenger of God, this was yet another symbolic reference to the four empires that were to reign over the world. The first animal was a winged lion. This animal represented the Babylonian Empire. The next beast was an animal with three ribs in its mouth, who was raised up on one side. This bear symbolized the Medo-Persian Empire, which ruled the world after Babylon. Then came the third beast, which was a leopard with four wings and four heads. This symbolized Greece, who conquered the world with blinding speed. After Alexander the Great died, his four generals took over the kingdom, and that is what the four heads symbolized. And then the fourth beast came, and this beast was a terrible beast. This beast 
was a symbol of the Roman Empire, and when it went forth, it crushed and destroyed. This beast had ten horns, and three of them were plucked up, and a little horn grew up. This part of the vision is very important, because it tells us what power is going to suppress God's people and His truth, right up to our present day, and continue on until the end. The power that was to trample upon God's sanctuary. This fourth beast was a symbol of the Roman Empire. The ten horns symbolized ten kings that were to arise out of this kingdom. When the Roman Empire fell in 479 AD, the territory was split among the ten Germanic tribes. According to the prophecy, three of these kings had to be conquered before the power symbolized by the little horn could rise up. This power would declare a very special battle against God. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, and had a mouth that spake very great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. After Jesus' resurrection, hatred for the Christians grew within the Roman Empire. Many Christians were persecuted because of their belief. The Apostle John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. There, God gave John a vision detailing what would happen to God's people in future generations. This vision complemented Daniel's visions and added more specific details to what would occur in the future. John saw another beast come out of the sea. It was made up of all the different religious and political characteristics of the empires that Daniel had seen. It had the feet of the bear, the body of the leopard, the mouth of the lion, and the horns of the terrible beast. Even though this animal comes after the four world empires, this beast would not itself become a world empire. This animal would come after the Roman Empire. It will reign over a divided Europe. The horn which grew out of the beast in Daniel chapter 7 and the beast in John's Revelation chapter 13 are identical. John received a deeper insight into the horn, which was also represented by the beast that declares war against God's people and blasphemes against the God of heaven right up until the end. In other places in the Bible, we're also warned against this power. Jesus, Peter, Paul and John all prophesied about falling away during the first century church. Thus, it was prepared the way for the coming of the Antichrist, a power that will deceive the whole world right up until Jesus comes. With great sorrow, Jesus declared, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen 
gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For over two thousand years God had tried to gather together and heal and build up those Israelites who would cling to the true God. But like the rest of Noah's descendants, they refused to be led by God. They didn't want to do it God's way and wanted to live life their own way. If they had chosen to do it God's way, they would have had such a better life. But they chose human leaders who led them astray. They mixed paganism with the ways of God because they wanted to be like the nations around them. And they worshipped goddesses and heroic gods, rejecting the commandments that were now no longer befitting. In the end, they rejected the Messiah that they had waited for with such incredible anticipation. In the year 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. In the beginning, the Christians were eager to keep the faith pure from man-made myths and legends, and all because of the experience of the Jews. Because of this, they were sorely persecuted from both the citizens and the rulers in the Roman Empire. And because they kept the true faith of God and refused to conform to pagan practices and theology, then the pagans were provoked to anger. Many lost their lives as they refused to bow their knees to the Roman leaders and their gods. In danger of losing their lives, they preached salvation through God alone and told them that the gods the Romans prayed to were actually only fallen angels and dead men. Even though the Christians advanced in social status when the Roman Empire tried to make peace with them, this would actually lead to an even worse spiritual condition. Many of the pagans that became Christians still loved the customs and traditions that they held as idol worshippers. At the same time, there was a hatred towards the Jews because of the way they had treated the Christians in Rome. Many of the Christians who were bitter towards the Jews became arrogant, even rejecting life that God had actually given to the Jews. It was like that Jesus wanted to be their foundation so they could understand who he was, what he stood for and what his will was for them. The result crept in surreptitiously. After several years of persecution, many agreed to peace, but only by compromise. And so the Christians became more and more paganized and adopted the pagan religion into the Christian faith. And the reward came without delay. When the Romans realized that their pagan worship had gained respect, they had no problem in welcoming Christ into their religious world. Jesus asked the Jews to witness to the world about him. Not only did he choose the Jews to do this, but he also told them to go to the lost tribes of Israel first. Together, they were to reach the pagans and tell the whole world about God, and the truth, his mission, and his salvation. This they did. Jesus and his disciples preached to the whole of Judea and Samaria. Subsequently, they were joined by more disciples, which included Paul, and they traveled to Ethiopia, Antioch, and Cyprus, Turkey, Persia, India, Galatia, 
and to the Celts. Many of these, among them Peter and Paul, warned them that there would come false teachings among the Christians. There would also be false teachers who would lead away Christianity in the wrong direction. Paul warned us directly and told us that there would come a falling away. The Jewish Christians that fled from Jerusalem after Stephen was stoned and before the destruction of Jerusalem moved north of Judea to Antioch and Syria. Therefore, Antioch did not just become a centre for missions to Africa, Ethiopia and Europe. It also became a place where the truth regarding the Messiah was faithfully preserved. Therefore the Christians in Antioch came into conflict with the Christians in Alexandria and Rome, who had already begun to intermingle the faith of Jesus with pagan philosophy. In Alexandria, there was a great hatred towards the Jews. Thus, the Alexandrians tried to distance themselves from the Jewish teachings and from the Jewish roots of Jesus. The congregation in Antioch tried to warn their brothers in Alexandria against this, but without any success. Gnosticism of Alexandria, Egypt. Antioch's rival was a union of pagan philosophy and gospel truths. While it was founding churches and building colleges, it rejected the Old Testament, denied creation, and held in contempt all Jews, even Christian Jews. The historian Newman goes on to describe the difference between the theology in Antioch and in Alexandria. In the great Christological controversies of the fourth and following centuries, Alexandria and Antioch were always antagonists. Alexandria representing a mystical transcendentalism and promoting the allegorical interpretation of the scriptures. Antioch insisting on the grammatico-historical interpretation of the scriptures and having no sympathy with mystical modes of thought. In their stand for the pure doctrines of Christianity, the churches of Syria were horrified at the license which so many so-called Christian teachers took with the scriptures, and they rebelled against the doctrines of Gnosticism which arose in the corrupted Christianity of the church in Alexandria. The school of Antioch led a revolt against the Alexandrian exegesis of holy scripture and founded a more critical method. The churches in Rome and Alexandria were growing closer to each other, and time after time they agreed on many religious decisions. Thus they gained great religious power. They changed the time for Passover, but the church in Antioch refused to follow their direction. Around 195 to 200 AD, the church in Antioch, along with several other churches in Asia, were excommunicated by Pope Victor I in Rome. Although Rome did not officially support Gnosticism, she was attracted by the mysterious and philosophical mindset. Just as the church in Rome collected Bible texts, so too did the church in Antioch. And from that time, we have two main groups of scripture, Textus Receptus from Antioch and Sinaiticus and Vaticanus from Alexandria. It was Lucian who lived from 250 to 312 AD who translated the Bible in Antioch. He was called a Judaist by the other Christians who didn't accept the Judeo-Christian mentality, despite Christ saying that Judeo-Christian mentality would represent the Gospel. Patient Lay and Lincoln said in their book Messianic Legacy that in the year 318 AD, eight Nazarene Jews, that is Christian Jews, met with Pope Sylvester in Rome, and it was their opinion that they, and not the Bishop of Rome, should decide who should be Bishop over Jerusalem, Antioch, Ephesus, and Alexandria. But the Pope refused to withdraw his nomination. They were unceremoniously dismissed and told that the Bishop in Rome was now the head of the Church. It has been said that this is the last communication between the Christian Nazarenes and with both the Papacy and the Orthodox Churches. As the Church in Rome gained more power, this new type of Christianity began to compromise her theological borders. In the 4th century, the church Christianized pagan tradition, which included temples for the saints, pagan festivals, processions, offerings of prayer and incense, blessing and dedication of land and property. At the end of the 4th century, it was taught that the priest received a special permanent holiness through his ordination, and they became thought of as a medium for the grace of God. Augustine developed his thought of predestination and the teaching of original sin. The leaders of the church in Ephesus were among those who heard Paul's warning against false teachings. Ephesus was the center for the church councils in 431 AD. 
and they wanted to condemn Nestorius. It was Cyril, who was a bishop from Alexandria, who was the main force behind condemning Nestorius and his followers. And he invited a church synod to meet here in Ephesus. And that was no coincidence, because here was the very city where Mary worship was now gaining immense popularity. Mary became a substitute for Artemis. We know that at this church meeting, Cyril attended with 60 bishops that he had summoned in order to condemn Nestorius. Nestorius also attended, and at that time he was bishop of Constantinople. He had friends whom he requested to come and support him. They came from the east with their leader, John from Antioch. He brought 43 men with him, but unfortunately they arrived too late, and Cyril refused to wait for them in order to arrive. So he started the church council and voted in favor of condemning Nestorius. The emperor at that time was Theodosius, and the pope in Rome was at that time Celestine, who also hurried to the meeting and their presence alone settled the issue with a powerful condemnation of Nestorius. So even if the other 43 men had arrived on time, it would have been to no avail now. Nestorius's teachings were first and foremost about the human and divine nature of Christ. By this, he set in stone his position that Mary was not the mother goddess, because he could see that the worship of Mary would increase and she would be worshipped as the mother of God. She wasn't his divine mother, she was his human mother. After Nestorius was condemned, he was dismissed from his position as Bishop of Constantinople and subsequently exiled to the desert in Fayum in Egypt, where he died 20 years later. We know that because of this church council, the worship of Mary was spread far and wide around the Byzantine and Roman world. It is most interesting to note that during the church council, women protesters from Ephesus gathered outside, calling for Mary to be elevated to the status of Mother Goddess. So Nestorius had much opposition from Ephesus. There were many controversies in the Christian faith. One of them was regarding the Sabbath. The churches that the Apostles started around the world kept the seventh day Sabbath, but the churches in Rome and Alexandria changed the Sabbath because of their clear distinction they wanted to make between themselves and the Jews, because they wanted to compromise with the pagan festivals and the Christian holy days. This pagan Christianity gained more and more respect with the Romans. For although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. God's foundation was removed and replaced by a pagan foundation. In early Christianity, the pillar of their faith was the Torah and the Old Testament. And the fulfillment of these scriptures was Jesus the Messiah. The later form of Christianity used the pagan religions as their pillar. And this pillar was not what the prophets said the Messiah would be. That was the ancient Roman pagan religion. And then they tried to make Christ the fulfillment of this. It was Constantine who would seal forever the falling away of the Christians and declare victory over them. He declared the Christian God handed him the crown and the victory. But Constantine did not respect the teaching of Jesus. Not only did he murder several of his own family members, but he united church and state, and Christianity and paganism. His conversion was a victory for the church in Rome, but a tragedy for the Christians who maintained the Judeo-Christian faith. Constantine and his followers were to hand the church of Rome ultimate power. For example, St. Peter's Basilica is built upon a sanctuary that Constantine built over what he claimed was Peter's grave. The Christians that kept the true faith fled Rome to the mountains of North Italy, close to the French border, and among them were the Waldenses.
Christian doctrines and its leadership were immensely controversial, but Constantine decided to unite Christendom through agreements. Votes were counted, and the results defined what doctrine was and what was not. It was exactly the same as the Roman Senate did with the Roman faith. The nature of God and the expression the Trinity were among those subjects they discussed and voted on during these church meetings. Constantine not only placed his mark on doctrines for his day, but embedded them in Christian doctrine until this day. Constantine didn't only elevate the Christian God, but elevated the pagan gods too. Constantine declared Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, to be the new capital of Rome. A 50 meter high pillar was placed in the middle of the city. On the top, he erected a large bronze plated statue. It resembled Constantine turning towards the east with a lance in one hand and a globe in the other, illustrating his victory by the goddess Victoria, a symbol of his power over the whole world. Upon his head was a crown of sunbeams. Only a few years after he had led the bishop's debate in the Council of Nicaea, Constantine appeared dressed as the sun god. Towards the end of the 4th century, they erected an altar by the bronze statue, where they were now celebrating Mass. Candles were lit, and incense was burned, and prayers were sent up to Constantine's statue atop the pillar. Also, Constantine is pictured below Sol in his triumphal arc. This medal shows Constantine and Sol Invictus as twins, one beside the other. Constantine's elevation of Sol Invictus and the mixture of Christianity and the sun god can still be seen in several churches where Christianity and sun worship is still mixed together. Even though many of the Christians worshipped God on the Sabbath, Constantine gave honour to the sun god, and for those Christians who rejected the Sabbath commandment, he instituted a Sunday law. In March 321 AD, he wrote, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. Also, the birthday and festival of the sun god, the 25th of December, was instituted as a feast day for pagans and Christians alike. Constantine passed a law to celebrate the birth of the sun god, the 25th of December, Natalis Solis Invicti. It shows how Sol Invictus and Jesus for him were two parts of the same god. The Christians still celebrate these two feast days which honour the sun god, and at the same time mingle them with Christianity. The change of the fourth commandment of God did not occur without struggle. Constantine's resolution against the Sabbath in favour of Sunday was not at that time a new concept. The Christians in Rome had for a long time done away with this commandment. Among those who rose up against this rejection of the commandments was Polycarp. Polycarp used to be a close friend of the Apostle John, who died around 100 AD. When he heard that Ancetus, the local bishop in Rome, had told the Christians to keep Sunday instead of the seventh day, he went to Rome in the year 155 AD to try to convince him to retract his statement. But the Bishop of Rome refused to listen to what Polycarp showed him from scripture, and he returned to Smyrna, where he died a martyr the next year. The pagan Christian assault against the Sabbath raged on. In the year 364, in an attempt to destroy the Sabbath among the Christians, a church council was held in Laodicea. And here was another famous church synod in the year 364. And in this meeting, it was decided that all Christians who kept Sabbath should be condemned by law and excommunicated. And all the Jewish Christians and all the other Christians who still kept the Seventh-day Sabbath from now on were called Judaists. And to keep the Sabbath was forbidden by law. 
From this time on, we don't hear anything more about Jewish Christians and the Roman Empire. Despite the Church of Rome now enjoying authority in the Roman Empire as the head of all Christianity, there were still many Christians who kept pure the true teachings of the Bible, and they refused to reject the Fourth Commandment and honour the Pagan Sunday. In the beginning, when they started to put into effect this law, there was great confusion, and this confusion spread to North Italy, where Ambrosius, the bishop in Milan, once said, When he was in Milan, he kept the Sabbath, and when he was in Rome, he kept holy the Sunday and fasted on Saturdays. Augustine also spoke of two neighbouring churches in North Africa. One kept the Sabbath and the other fasted on the Sabbath. The Celts, who were taught by the Galatians, who were taught by, among others, the Apostle Paul, held to another Bible translation that differed from the Bible used in the church in Alexandria and Rome. And they refused to abandon the Sabbath as the Christian day of rest. The churches in Ireland and Scotland, therefore, kept the Sabbath for many centuries and refused to acknowledge the Bishop of Rome. The Apostle Paul also gave the Gospel to the Greeks, and regarding the Greek churches, it was once said, There is not any city of the Grecians, nor any of the barbarians, not any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day hath not come. The Gentile Christians observed also the Sabbath. The primitive Christians did keep the Sabbath of the Jews. Therefore, the Christians, for a long time together, did keep their conventions upon the Sabbath, in which some portions of the law were read. And this continued to the time of the Laodicean Council. And the Isles shall wait for his law. It was the practice generally of the Eastern churches and some churches of the West. For in the Church of Milan, it seems the Saturday was held in a far esteem, not that the Eastern churches, or any of the rest which observed that day, were inclined to Judaism, but that they came together on the Sabbath day, to worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. They despise our sun god. Did not Zoroaster, the sainted founder of our divine beliefs, institute Sunday one thousand years ago? in honour of the sun, and supplant the Sabbath of the Old Testament, which the Jews in our land then sanctified. Yet these Christians have divine services on Saturday. The Nestorians eat no pork and keep the Sabbath. They believe in neither auricular confession nor purgatory. Bulgaria, in the early season of its evangelization, had been taught that no work should be performed on the Sabbath. Abyssinian or Ethiopian Christianity kept, among other things, the Sabbath for more than 17 centuries. In 1534, the Abyssinian legate at the court of Lisbon was told, It is not, therefore, in imitation of the Jews, but in obedience to Christ and his holy apostles, that we observe the day. The God of the Bible once said to the believers that the Sabbath was a sign that they worshipped the only true God, and not a false God. The Sabbath was not only a sign that they kept the original teachings, but was also to be an example to the apostate Christians that fell away. It showed that the true believers regarded the Bible to be higher than the decisions and authority of the church. The apostate Christians tried to persuade them that they were chosen of God to be church leaders and that their decisions were blessed by God. Then, when various groups of Christians kept the Sabbath, it threatened their self-proclaimed authority and they started to attack them. If they were not going to believe that they were the chosen of God, then they would force them to believe it. And that's how the persecution against God's people, who kept the commandments, began. When the Roman Empire gave the power to the bishops of Rome, and the papacy started their rule of over 1,200 years. Then the persecution of the Sabbath-keeping Christians intensified until they were almost completely wiped out. And now they have almost been wiped out of the history books as well. Even now, Sabbath-keeping Christians are being demonized by some who still insist on observing Sunday. They suffer the same accusations today as they have done for the last 2,000 years. The Catholic people had full religious freedom while the Christians who held fast to God's commandments and had the faith of Jesus were persecuted, tortured and killed. 
While the Catholic Church built grand cathedrals with extravagant decor and enjoyed decadent attire, the Christians who kept God's commandments were forced to worship God in exile, in caves and in dens. Among them were the Waldenses in North Italy, who used this actual cave as a place of worship. They continue to spread the text of the Bible, which came from the schools of Antioch. The Spirit of Christ is also the spirit of missionary work. So it was with the Waldenses. They couldn't just keep the truth they had learned for themselves, but they felt compelled to share it with others. And when the Bible was forbidden, they copied it and taught their youth in its truths. From here, the school of Barba in Pra del Torno. In the Dark Ages, the Bible was reserved for the Catholic priests and it was forbidden to copy it. Despite risking their lives, they rebelled against these prohibitions and they copied and smuggled out the Bible from places such as this. The mountains that girded their lowly valleys were a constant witness to God's creative power and a never-failing assurance of his protecting care. Those pilgrims learned to love the silent symbols of Jehovah's presence. They indulged no repining because of the hardships of their lot. They were never lonely amid the mountain solitudes. They thanked God that he had provided for them an asylum from the wrath and cruelty of men. They rejoiced in their freedom to worship before him, Often, when pursued by their enemies, the strength of the hills proved a sure defense. From many a lofty cliff they chanted the praise of God, and the armies of Rome could not silence their songs of thanksgiving. It was the Roman Emperor Justinian who made a decree that the Pope was to have both religious and political power. And when the Goths in 538 AD were driven out of Rome, then the Pope solidified his power. All this was prophesied beforehand by the prophet Daniel, the Apostle John and Paul. A falling away would come, a false gospel would be preached, and an Antichrist will come forth from the ruins of the Roman Empire and place himself as a leader, even as a god in the Christian Church. He would receive his power from the dragon or from the Roman Empire and will continue with the same cruelty and teachings of their heathen gods, but this time cloaked in Christianity. Here you can see the Roman gods Dionysus and Pan and Constantine and Justinian's summer palace, proving they clung to their pagan gods despite outwardly promoting the Christian faith. In Justinian's aqueduct, we can see the Roman mythological figure Medusa. Medusa had the hair of serpents and was to the Romans a goddess who protected the warriors, houses and buildings. Here in Ephesus, you can also see her with the famous serpent and she's now posing in the ceiling of the Vatican. 
When the Roman religious power decided to replace their pagan gods with Christ, they began on a religious struggle for power that the Pope continued. Pagan mentality just with Christian names. Many pagan temples were simply turned into Christian churches. This church in Rome is built upon an old Mithra temple. Mithra was the son of the sun god, the bringer of light and the saviour. Here is a famous depiction of Mithra with an illustration of the sun and the moon god either side, and here on a statue of Diana. Here, placed on either side of a crucified Christ in the Catholic Church. This Christian bowl shows the mixture of Roman symbolism with Christian, satire and the god Eros with the cross above so it can be used in the Christian Church. On this church camel from the treasures in the Vatican, we can see the Roman god of nature just above the emblem of the Pope. This demon was also common in Babylon. You can see him here, and in the world of Egyptian mythology, his name was Bess. The Roman goddess Venus was supposedly born from a shell. Here in this early Christian ornamental box is Venus in her shell, surrounded by Christian inscriptions. The shell represented the goddess Venus in ancient Rome. Today, it's the favourite decor of the Catholic Church. Here is a statue of Christ holding a shell that represents Venus. The shell was also used in the mythological world of India. Here, it read the Greek Poseidon, or the Roman Neptune, with a shell over his head. The shell was a common symbol in the Roman Empire. Here, from a Catholic Church. Here is the shell again, on a Roman building, with Neptune's trident above it. And here in a Roman Catholic church. And here from another church, where it's Jesus Christ who lifts up the shell. An old Roman statue of Venus. And here, Catholic. The god Eros was a baby with wings. He was often depicted holding a bunch of grapes and was a very popular decoration in the Roman Empire. Here's the god Eros in his new job, here in a Catholic church where he's holding the cross. Here, Eros is crowning Mary. Here, he's being very helpful holding up the Pope's tiara. The cross again. And here, on an emblem of the Pope, Here, the god Eros is counterfeiting baby Jesus. Many think that the halo is a Christian phenomenon, but it's not. It comes from paganism and the Roman Empire. Here's the god Neptune and his wife with a halo. Here's the god Saul with a halo on an ancient mirror. Here's the halo behind the head of the serpent from the time of the Emperor Augustus a tradition that was Christianized by the Catholic Church. The use of halos probably originated in the East. Here's the halo behind the head of Buddha. And three female figures, each with a halo. The Catholic Church has placed the halo behind the head of the Apostle Peter, and behind Mary, Jesus and the Apostles, and also their saints. The halo of the Roman sun god was very special. It had sunbeams protruding from it, here from Pergamon. 
and here from ancient Rome. Here the Catholic Church has placed the halo behind the head of God. Maybe it's the sun god in disguise. The Bible never once mentions female angels. Female angels come from Greek and Roman mythology and represent the goddess Nike or Victoria. Today this goddess is commonly seen in the Catholic Church. The goddess Nike is recognisable by her bare breast, her wings and her unique hairstyle, like here in ancient Ephesus. Here Nike has a new job to honour the papacy in the Vatican. Here's the goddess Athena in this well-known posture, with her helmet, snake-skin dress draped around her body and displaying the pendant of Medusa's head. Here from the Catholic Church, by the Pope's feet, sits the twin sister of Athena, with the helmet, the snakeskin and the Medusa head. When you've studied the Roman religio-political power, it's not hard to see that the papacy continued the Roman method of government in religious matters. The Pope even adopted the titles of the Roman emperors and Rome's symbols like Pontifex Maximus and the Father of the People. The Emperor Augustus became the high priest over many different religions and the emperor that succeeded him did the same. Here he is dressed in the priestly garments of Pontifex Maximus. The symbol was the ladle. Here you can see it among other priestly symbols from other priesthoods. The Emperor's title, Pontifex Maximus and Father of the People, can be seen engraved on Roman coins, a title and symbol that the Pope of Rome adopted for himself. Here we can see a coin with the Pope and the title of Pontifex Maximus. And here from St. Peter's Basilica. The Roman Emperor was also High Priest for the Augur Priesthood, who was a Master of Astrology. On this old Roman coin you can see the Pontifexes and the hook beside it as the Augur priesthood's symbol and staff. The popes continue the tradition of using the staff with the symbol of the Augur priesthood. After Julius Caesar died, when Augustus came to power, he built a temple over Emperor Caesar's tomb. Augustus was the driving force behind the deification of Caesar. After that, he could call himself the Son of God and that gave him more power. The Pope's claim is no less today. He claims for himself the title the Vicar of the Son of God and demands power accordingly. Pergamon was a city in Asia Minor that is mentioned in the Bible as the place where the throne of Satan was. Pergamon was the place where they first built temples in honour of the emperors in order to worship them as gods. The Christians in the Roman Empire suffered martyrdom because they refused to bow before any of the emperors. The Pope continued in the emperor's agenda, only cloaked in a Christianity, and succeeded therefore in duping Christians to bow before him and serve him. Not only that, but all the idols and icons of gods who the Christians previously refused to pray to were no longer so threatening when they were named after saints. Notice this hand sign that can be seen on the statues of popes. Statues of Christ. And even in the Far East. This hand sign was part of a cult in the Roman Empire, the cult of Sabasius, who originally was a mixture of Zeus and Dionysus. Here's a statue of Zeus, or Jupiter. Now it's on the illustrations of Jesus, and here on the statue of Peter. Jesus again, and the Pope. 
You may well wonder if there's any god in the Roman and Greek Empire that the Roman Catholic Church has not incorporated in some way or another into their churches today. Pagans place their gods in altars like this. Here you have a goddess in an altar. Here's another goddess. And in the same way, the Catholic Church worships her gods. Here's Mary. And here's Mary again. This is from Pompeii, a Roman city. They place their idols in altars like this. In Rome today, the Virgin Mary with child. The Church preserved the pagan tradition. This is what Baal looks like, and this is the stone icon they used when they worshipped him. It's exactly what God abhors. Catholics today use icons of Christ to pray to. The concept of nuns and monks was also adopted in from Babylon and Roman tradition. Instead of having nuns for Vesta, they now have nuns for Christ. A completely pagan tradition and philosophy. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans all had a tradition that the rulers took upon themselves symbols of whichever gods they honoured, and also to show that these gods honoured them. The divine symbols also showed that the god was present there. Here's the Roman Emperor Antonius, dressed like the sun god Osiris. Here's Alexander the Great, with the attributes of the god Zeus, the horn. Here, Alexander's dressed in the lion headdress, that was the symbol of the god Hercules. This woman, at the feet of the Pope in St. Peter's Basilica, is wearing the headdress of Hercules. Here's the Emperor Augustus, with the attributes of Jupiter, holding the globe, and before it was destroyed, he was holding the staff. And here from a Catholic church, here it's Jesus who holds the attributes of Jupiter, the globe and the staff. Here from pagan Pergamon. And the woman with the globe has also found her place in the Catholic church. Here's the Greek god Zeus, with the well-known symbol, the bolt of lightning. In St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, this woman holds the lightning bolt of Zeus in one hand and a cross in the other. Others also hold Zeus's attributes, here again from St. Peter's Basilica. The sun god Sol's identification was of course the sun halo. Here again from St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the woman at the feet of the Pope wears the halo of the sun and the cross. The god Isis, with a snake entwined around her arm, with his head held in her hand. Here you can see the same symbol in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church you can see baby Jesus with the globe and two fingers pointing upwards. No different from what we find in the Far East, here with two fingers up and the globe in his hand. Here's Mary with the sun behind her and the globe in her hand. The Babylonians spread around the pagan religion over the whole world, especially in the Middle East. Under the Roman Empire, the world's religions were gathered together under one roof. When the papacy came and took over the Roman Emperor's title and crown, 
Then the church also took over all the traditions of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, thus sealing their apostasy in the name of Christ. These cities in Babylon were once centres of religion and their teachings were spread abroad by the travelling merchants. Originally, the false teachings of ancient Babylon spread around the future nations of the world when the Tower of Babel failed and the people were dispersed. This is where the sun god originated from and therefore sun worship. These famous symbols belong to the sun god and his kingdom. Among them, solar wheel, solar cross, the sun and eagle's wings, the serpent and the moon. Here you can see all these symbols together, the cross around his neck, the serpent on his head, the half moon and the sun over his head and the eagle's wings at the top. The sun god was the giver of life. Here the sun delivers the unk or life. Shamash, the Babylonian sun god, had this symbol. The straight-edged cross and the wavy sunbeams emanating from it. Here's the sun god on his throne with his mark on the altar in front. Here's the mark of the Babylonian sun god in a Catholic church, with two people inside who are supposed to be Mary and Jesus. The church developed this symbol. Here's another cross with the undulating sunbeams. The Babylonian pendant shows a very special design, the straight sunbeams and the undulating sunbeams all mixed within each other. And here we see the same symbol in the Catholic Church, who clearly keep Babylon's tradition. The symbol of the sun was loved in Babylon because they honoured the sun god, and today it's in the Catholic Church who also exalt the sun god. You can find them on relics, altars and surrounding icons of God. From St. Peter's Basilica again, the woman at the feet of the Pope is holding the sun as if it were her baby. Here's another at the feet of the Pope and the sun on her chest. And here again from St. Peter's Basilica. The God in heaven never intended for sun symbols to be mixed into worship for him, nevertheless, here in the Catholic Church. Here's a statue of the Pope with a sun on each hand. The sarcophagus of a Pope with a sun on his hand, here again. Is he a priest for the sun god, or for the god of heaven? The solar wheel was also famous in sun worship in Babylon. Here also from Babylon. Here we see the solar wheel decorating a pagan temple in India. Here from the famous temple in Dendera in Egypt, the sun wheel with the zodiac around it. And here we see Mary lifting up the solar wheel. This is probably the world's largest solar wheel in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican in the city of the Catholic Church, Rome. The woman holds the solar wheel, here from the Catholic Church, and here from Babylon, and here again there's decor on a Catholic Church. The half moon is also a famous religious symbol from Babylon, here with the sun above it, here on a seal from Babylon, here again on another artifact. Here we have the Egyptian god with the same symbol, 
here again from Babylon. Here in front of a Catholic church you see the symbol by the foot of the cross with the famous Babylonian symbol in the centre. The most common place we find this symbol is in the Catholic church, on the object they keep the Eucharist on, or the communion bread. The object has the form of the sun with the half moon inside it. When one places the Eucharist in the half moon, then one has the complete Babylonian symbol. These objects were first used in Nimrod's time. The symbol of the moon god was often placed on the head, here from pagan Rome, and here on the Indian god Shiva, and here a Roman goddess with a symbol. Here's the goddess Ishtar in Babylon, and here on a picture of Mary in the Catholic Church. Here, as we've already seen, we can see the Egyptian king and queen receiving life, Ankh, from the sun. Here, from the Catholic Church, the apostles receive power, or the Holy Ghost, from the sun. The serpent either symbolised the sun god, or was closely connected. After Satan took on the form of a serpent, and seduced Adam and Eve, the serpent was cursed and damned to crawl on his belly. Here the serpents recovered his legs in an Egyptian tomb depicting the funeral procession. In pagan mythology, the serpent had wings. Here's the throne adopting the winged serpent. Here's the throne of Bacchus. The winged serpent is carved into the back of the throne. In South America, the sun god was born out of the mouth of the serpent. Here from Egypt, the sun with a serpent wrapped around it, an eagle's wings. And again from Egypt, the sun with two serpents hanging over it and the eagle's wings. The sun with wings finds its origins in Babylon. Here the sun and the moon symbol. Again the sun has wings. Here from the Catholic Church, the statue of Mary and Jesus, where Mary has the sun with the wings on her chest. On the bottom of the same statue is the serpent. This staff used by the Catholic priesthood ends in a serpent or a dragon with wings. Here from Babylon, two dragons with wings guard two serpents that are entwined around a pillar. The serpent on the staff was also used in the pagan religions in Rome and Greece. Here from Ephesus. In the city of Pergamon, the god that carried the serpent on the staff was the most popular attraction. Here from Asia Minor. Here's the Egyptian god Anubis that carries the winged serpent on his staff. Here on one of the Vatican's many paintings. And here you see the same symbol in a painting on the roof of the Vatican. The all-seeing eyes are gathered from Egypt and ancient Babylon. In Tel Brat, they have found an entire temple full of the all-seeing eye. The eye is connected to the mother goddess. The eye was used on Mesopotamian and Egyptian amulets and jewellery. The mythological eye has now been adopted into Christianity, here from the Catholic Church. Here we see the eye inside the triangle, surrounded by the sun. Here you see the eye in the sun. Is it the eye of God, or is it the eye of the sun god? In Babylon, they used the rosary, which was also used in Eastern religions. Here, from a Catholic church, Jesus has taken over the custom of Babylon, According to this painting, Jesus also wants to use the rosary. This custom is identical to paganism. The Babylonian goddess Ishtar had the lion as her symbol, here under her throne. Here, 
placed under her feet. And here, standing on the winged lion, Ishtar was called the Queen of Heaven. Here from the Vatican, Mary is riding the winged lion with a cup in her hand. From Babylon, two lions stand either side of a symbolic tree. From a Catholic church of Mary, the sun with Mary inside and two lions each side of the tree. From the same church, Mary's new symbol. The Queen of Heaven on the Lion was often depicted with the stars surrounding her head. Today, it's Mary who's called the Queen of Heaven, here with the stars around her head. The goddess Artemis was pictured with two outstretched arms, like a mother reaching out for her children. Here's Mary in the Catholic Church. Paganism has changed its name, but not its practices. When Mary gave birth to Jesus, it didn't make her a god, but made Jesus a man. The Bible never mentions the deification of Mary, neither does it ever mention that she went straight to heaven, but it does say that God forbids the worship of any being other than himself. I am the Lord, and that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Without any regard for what God requests, the Catholic Church has taken the liberty to crown Mary, and here the angels worship her, and not God. The forerunner of Ishtar, was the goddess Inanna. Often, she was depicted with bare breasts, like here from Babylon. Here's the goddess Isis with her divine son. Here's the Roman goddess with her Eros. And here again, Roman. A very popular symbol now taken over by Mary. A bare breast here again from the Catholic Church. It's ironic that most of the Catholic churches are built upon graveyards, and kings and queens are buried inside the churches. From St. Denis in Paris, from Rome, and from St. Peter's Basilica. The pagan worshippers thought that they could pray to this deceased so they could intercede for them. That's why tombs were always placed inside temples. As we said, Emperor Augustus also built a temple for Caesar's tomb, and the Catholic Church adopted this Roman tradition. Here from the Catholic Church, a place to kneel in front of the casket. Here's a monk kneeling and praying to the dead.
the Catholic Church continues the apostasy. Here, baby Jesus is covered in gold. Here is an idol of God in gold. Shockingly, the Catholic priests still use the headdress and the attire that were used by the Babylonian priests. See here. The priests in God's sanctuary had a headdress. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus took over the priesthood after he ascended, and he's now the high priest in the sanctuary in heaven. The Catholic Church was never supposed to carry out the priesthood. That was given to Jesus alone. The Babylonian priesthood was well known for its grand headdress, the fish mitre. Here a deceased pope with a mitre. This is an Egyptian hat. Catholic priests, Babylonian, and Peter with the same hat. This hat is from Pergamon. You can notice two flaps protruding from it. The Pope's hat has the same design. The triple tiara was a crown that symbolized power here from Babylon. The Pope also has a triple crown. The priests and kings in Babylon used this symbol around their neck to show that they had submitted to the sun god. Today it's the Catholic priests, bishops and popes who wear the same Babylonian sun crosses around their necks. Here we can see it from the sun cult in South America. Here is the serpent god himself with his symbol on the shield. Here from a Babylonian cylindrical seal. And here you can see it on the Catholic clothing. Everywhere in the church the sun god is honoured. This was also the symbol of Baal with a circle around the cross. Now, Baal's symbol is placed behind the head of Christ in the Catholic Church. Do you recognize this church symbol? Originally, it was a Greco-Egyptian symbol of Isis, Seraphis and Dionysus. It's just been adopted straight into the Catholic Church. Babylonian priests wore floral symbols on their wrists. Here in the Catholic Church, and the Pope with the same flower in his hand. God speaks strongly against the worshippers of Baal in the Bible, but the word Baal simply means Lord. Their supreme God was named El, just like the name of the Israelite God, El. That's why it could be confusing, but it wasn't the name they used that showed if they worshipped the true God. It was their obedience, and if they kept God's commandments.
Why does God warn us so strongly against this church and say that its leader is the Antichrist? The Catholic Church has from its inception been Satan's attack on God's truth. And the Bible says God never changes. But nor does Satan and his fallen angels. Here we can learn from the devil's attack on Israel. First he tried to kill them. But when God protected them and the devil failed, then he deceived them into mixing paganism with God's truth. Satan did exactly the same with the Christian movement. First, Satan tried to kill the Christians through the Roman Empire, but he failed, and the Christians increased in number. When he lost this battle, he tried to destroy the Christian movement from the inside by infiltrating it with pagan teachings and ceremonies. He thereby deceived most of the Christians, and only a few remained loyal to God, recognizing the devil in sheep's clothing. To deceive the Israelites into worshipping Baal, Satan tricked them into praying to the dead. The dead, as the Bible says, are sleeping in the grave. Therefore, it's only the fallen angels who answer those prayers. And by doing this, Satan usurped the place of God in their lives. The exact same thing that happens in the Catholic Church today. The Catholic Church has deceived them into praying to dead saints, and even Mary, who is also dead in the grave instead of to God. Thus, Satan steals their prayers and usurps their loyalty. And all this in the name of God. God has to warn people against this, to give them a chance to wake up from this deception. In the same way Satan used the Roman Empire to persecute the Christians, he now uses the Catholic Church to destroy them with idolatry. In addition to this, the Catholic Church killed many of those Christians who refused to follow their paganized form of Christianity. With his success, he mocked God with icons and idols and the teachings of Catholicism. Most are blinded that they fail to see what's happening around them. Satan uses all his power to destroy the true understanding of Christ through those who call themselves his representatives but do the total opposite of his will. When Jesus came, he said he was not going to take honour upon himself, but those who would claim to come after him would take honour for themselves. Where Jesus dressed humbly, Satan dressed the Pope like a king. While God darkened the sun during Christ's worst moments on the cross, hiding his agony from the people, Satan provided the sun to shine brightly above thousands of images of Christ in all his agony. When God forbade images, Satan provided them, mass-producing them, so people could pray and worship in front of them. When God said that the Saturday Sabbath was a sign between man and God, Satan claimed that Sunday was that sign. When Jesus told us not to call anyone on earth our Father, because one is your Father, he who is in heaven, so Satan provided this blasphemy for the people, calling the Pope Holy Father. When Jesus lifted up the written word, Satan shut it away from the ordinary person and told them it was dangerous. Scripture says there's one mediator between man and God, but Satan provided many mediators to pray to. When the scripture said that only Jesus can give us salvation, Satan provided Mary to pray to. 
offering them salvation through her. And you can even earn your salvation through work. When the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the church, the Catholics claim that Mary is the head of the church, Mater Ecclesia. The Bible says that Messiah was going to crush the head of the serpent, and the Catholic Church claims this is Mary. When God said, don't make any images of me, because he hates it, then Satan provided images and statues of God, and even naked. He became a decoration of the church. We're also told in the Bible how God hated the Babylonian worship symbols, their ceremonies and sun symbols, and how his faithful people removed this from the temple in Israel's history. Of course then Satan ensured that these symbols became the most highly cherished in the Catholic Church, and even placed God in the middle of the very symbols he hated. And we could go on and on, but unfortunately we don't have time in this production. Okay, let's take a moment and breathe. If you love Jesus and love God, these things will break your heart. Because your loyalty is towards God and you will not want to upset or offend him. You don't want anything to come between you and God, especially not a false Christian representative. Because the Pope is not a Christian representative. He represents the exact opposite of everything Christ stood for, and the opposite of the way of God. Christ exalted the law of God. But the Pope doesn't respect God's law, and has even changed it. Therefore, the Pope is not a representative of Christ, but is in fact Antichrist. This is sad, but true. There's no need to wonder who the beast is. It's no secret, and it never has been a secret. According to Jesus, who warns us against the beast in Revelation, he says to reveal the vision, because he wanted to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Don't follow the beast. Don't be fooled, because the beast and its followers will perish. Trust in the Bible, the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus as the only mediator and saviour. Then you will know for sure that you're a true child of God, and no one will be able to break the bond between you and your father, not even death. But what is the mark of the beast that you're not to take on your forehead in your hand? So what is the mark of the beast? And why doesn't God want us to take this mark in our forehead and in our hands? The beast in Revelation gets its power from the dragon, is described as the little horn in Daniel, and has some of the characteristics from each of the four beasts before the little horn, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible beast. The Bible tells us something important about the dragon and his battle against God and his people. It tells us that the dragon is against those who have the testimony of Jesus and keep the Ten Commandments. The Bible also tells us that those who keep the Ten Commandments will not receive the mark of the beast. That means that the mark of the beast must be some kind of attack upon God's commandments. The change of the fourth commandment, the seventh day, from Saturday to Sunday, has always been a mark of apostate Christianity and the Catholic Church, declaring that the commandments of man are over the commandments of God and the Bible. And those who obey this change are those who recognize the authority of the Pope in Christian matters. God asked the Israelites to place his commandments in their hand and in their forehead, in their mind and their works, and that the Sabbath should be a special sign that showed if they worshipped the true God. The mark of the beast will be found either on the forehead or the hand, and that shows that the beast will put his law there instead of the law of God. The Sabbath has thereby become the new tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Why should one tree among so many other fruit trees seal the apostasy of man against God? 
It's the same with the Sabbath today. It can be difficult for us to understand why this commandment is so important to us in our relationship with God. The only thing we are able to understand is that God has put it there. Do we trust him? There's just one way to not receive the mark of the beast in your forehead or in your hand, and that is to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Sabbath commandment contains God's name, title, and dominion. So by protecting the Sabbath, the Lord's name, title, and dominion will be placed in your forehead and in your hand. But if you keep nine of the commandments, but throw away this one, then you've removed his name and his seal from your life, because this is the only commandment that identifies him as our creator and the place of his jurisdiction. The beast that replaced this commandment with a new day, Sunday, will therefore place his name, the Son, in the midst of the other nine commandments, and you will receive the mark of the beast. The commandments of the beast and the commandments of God. Which commandments will you have in your heart and practice with your hand? Whose servant will you be? The Catholic attack on true Christians has always been directed towards God's commandments, and especially the Sabbath. Sunday being the mark of their power, and Sabbath being the mark of those who refuse to recognize the authority of the Pope. Of those who do not want to follow the Catholic Church, but want to continue to be faithful to God during the final crisis that is soon to break upon the earth, it is said, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God asks you to leave those denominations today. And those denominations who are influenced by the Catholic Church and who have intermingled paganism with Christ, the reason why God says this is because these churches will soon receive the judgments of God for all the abominations they have done in his name. All those they have murdered during the centuries they were in power, for all the lies they've spread and for all those they've led astray. Jesus says, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. The judgment will soon fall, and if you want to keep your eternal life, then you must leave those churches now. This is Christ's own personal warning to people today. Please listen to his call, and let him be your only saviour.
political characteristics of the empires that Daniel had seen. It had the feet of the bear, the body of the leopard, the mouth of the lion, and the horns of the terrible beast. Even though this animal comes after the four world empires, this beast would not itself become a world empire. This animal would come after the Roman Empire. It will reign over a divided Europe. The horn which grew out of the beast in Daniel chapter 7 and the beast in John's Revelation chapter 13 are identical. John received a deeper insight into the horn, which was also represented by the beast that declares war against God's people and blasphemes against the God of heaven right up until the end. In other places in the Bible, we're also warned against this power. Jesus, Peter, Paul and John all prophesied about falling away during the first century church. Thus, it was prepared the way for the coming of the Antichrist, a power that will deceive the whole world right up until Jesus comes. The first animal was a winged lion. This animal represented the Babylonian Empire. The next beast was an animal with three ribs in its mouth, who was raised up on one side. This bear symbolized the Medo-Persian Empire, which ruled the world after Babylon. Then came the third beast, which was a leopard with four wings and four heads. This symbolized Greece, who conquered the world with blinding speed. After Alexander the Great died, his four generals took over the kingdom and that is what the four heads symbolised. And then the fourth beast came, and this beast was a terrible beast. This beast was a symbol of the Roman Empire,
In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream to show him what will happen in the future. None of his wise men or seers could tell him what he dreamed, or interpret the dream. Their wisdom was exposed as a fake, so the king commanded all of them to be executed. Among the king's wise men and servants was a Hebrew man called Daniel. Daniel turned to God in prayer, and God showed him both the king's dream and its interpretation, so Daniel explained it to the king. Daniel told the king that none of the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers would be able to interpret his dream, but that there was a God in heaven who revealed secrets, and that God had revealed to Nebuchadnezzar what would happen in the last days. The head of gold was a symbol of the Babylonian Empire. After that, there will rise another empire, less powerful, and then another empire, and another, and eventually the empire will be divided. The stone that hit the statue was a symbol of God's kingdom. In the days of these kings, God will raise up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and the kingdom will not be given over to any other nation thereafter. This prophecy is from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the kingdom of God will be established at the end of history. But God showed Daniel more. In the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, we're told that Daniel received a vision. This vision was about four beasts that come up from out of the sea. According to the messenger of God, this was yet another symbolic reference to the four empires that were to reign over the world. And when it went forth, it crushed and destroyed. This beast had ten horns and three of them were plucked up, and a little horn grew up. This part of the vision is very important, because it tells us what power is going to suppress God's people and His truth, right up to our present day, and continue on until the end. The power that was to trample upon God's sanctuary. This fourth beast was a symbol of the Roman Empire, the ten horns symbolized ten kings that were to arise out of this kingdom. When the Roman Empire fell in 479 AD, the territory was split among the ten Germanic tribes. According to the prophecy, three of these kings had to be conquered before the power symbolized by the little horn could rise up. This power would declare a very special battle against God. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, and had a mouth that spake very great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. After Jesus' resurrection, hatred for the Christians grew within the Roman Empire. Many Christians were persecuted because of their belief. The Apostle John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. There, God gave John a vision detailing what would happen to God's people in future generations. This vision complemented Daniel's visions and added more specific details to what would occur in the future. John saw another beast come out of the sea. It was made up of all the different religious and 